Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, um, and uh, my background is actually fairly long, so uh, I guess I'll just uh, cut it short and then I can talk about some of the previous stuff I was doing. But ultimately, I've never had a office job. I always worked remote and I've uh, mostly worked with startups even uh, when I was basically a developer. Before being a developer, I was actually a marketer. I would just sell my services on Upwork, you know, do the content marketing stuff. And, uh, but uh, um, I basically got into um, Ethereum uh, in 2017 and, uh, you know, got crushed by the, the bull market. <laughs> and then basically I just uh, knew that I was going to stick around. And uh, that's when I, I initially wrote some very basic JavaScript stuff. Uh, uh, like I took a Udemy course and, you know, wrote like the greeter contract. Uh, um, and basically from that, uh, um, uh, I ended up going back into kind of the, basically I was consulting on a website called Code Mentor where you can uh, uh, coach uh, and you basically get paid by the minutes to coach. It's, it's actually a super engaging job where you just have a bunch of clients, you just uh, uh, coach them through stuff and you get paid. It's, it's really cool. And then I actually met uh, Shane who was the founder at uh, Polymarket and that's uh, how I basically, like I built like a, I basically built the front end for uh, that uh, specific DAP and that's how I uh, kind of got back into crypto and from then uh, uh, I just decided I was going to learn smart contracts and I did hackathons and uh, through winning some hackathons I ended up uh, getting a job at Badger which is what I currently have. Uh, I'm a developer at Badger, we're working on a product called DBTC and then uh, through the connection at Badger, I also met uh, people like Codarina because Codarina was really nascent at the time. I think I, the first contest I participated in was the MeBits contest. And uh, then with Badger, we sponsored a bunch of contests. We did like six different uh, uh, security contests uh, in a row with them. And uh, uh, from that point, uh, uh, I was offered uh, to become a, a judge at Codarina. And uh, I wasn't particularly good at finding bugs, so I thought it was an amazing opportunity to learn. And that's kind of how I got uh, uh, basically into the security space where uh, I was basically becoming a developer and uh, learning the ropes and trying to write stuff that was solid and safe. And, uh, um, uh, and I, in trying to make it safe, I also basically ended up uh, kind of getting more passionate around the, the security stuff. Yeah, I feel like there's a very common path for many that end up in the auditing realm of things. They start as a developer and they, they realize that security is actually really important and end up falling in love with it somehow. It's funny that you say that you're not really good at finding bugs in where you are now. Yeah, I'd say I got, um, like, I feel like it's like a, it, there's like this, this luck there but uh, I kind of genuinely believe that I really started from uh, from nothing. And um, like, um, I don't remember what the popular course was back then. I think it was already the Ethernaut uh, course. There was like this Ethernaut thing. But like, I remember having to kind of learn Solidity by looking at like uh, Yearn repositories, like literally just read the code and try and figure it out. Uh, so I feel like uh, that's that's where I started. And then uh, through just being on Twitter and kind of trying to find the people that had a lot of uh, interesting information, uh, I basically found a few of these opportunities such as Code Arena. Uh, and then uh, it basically all came from Twitter, to be honest, because uh, uh, at the end of the day, crypto is a fairly small uh, community. And uh, if, you, if you pay enough attention, you eventually find kind of these opportunities literally lying uh, there. Yeah, that's so crazy of how Twitter can help you in so many ways, give you access to so many people. If you just look around and try to engage and try to share what you're going through at the moment. And back in 2017, there must have been so little resources as well. Now there's like a plethora of solidity courses, auditing courses. There's so many resources. It's almost too easy to get started. Yeah, and that was kind of my goal. Uh, like uh, a couple of years ago, I did. Um, I was working on a um, uh, UI tool called uh, Magic Wallet, and uh, Magic is actually a company that still exists. Uh, you would say they do account abstraction now, but basically, you just create a wallet for your email. That's really what it was, and uh, I did like a call with. Um, 
his name escapes me, with Austin Griffith. And basically, uh, but my goal was to actually become a teacher and just teach people how to code, etc. But what I found was that the more I started to learn about uh, Solidity, developing front ends, decentralized networks and security, the more there was there to learn. And so I feel like I never got to uh, the potential of my learning. And so that's why I never ended up making any course, uh, even though I drawn, I'm drawn to that. Uh, I just feel like there's so much more to learn and to learn it, you really have to, to go hard and just, just gotta grind it out. And uh, I don't think there's enough time in the day to both be a great teacher and also be a great security researcher. And so that's kind of the decision I made at this point is that I'm, uh, uh, I try to you know, do the office hours with Coderina and uh, do, like, share some stuff by open sourcing some of my work. But I also understand that uh, to, to market properly just takes a lot of effort. And so I just focus more on the skill right now because uh, that's, that's what I think I, uh, like if I had, um, I feel like I can always be a better marketer, but I, there will be a day where I will not be able to be a better security researcher with the opportunity that we have today. Because I feel like in a few years, there's not going to be the same opportunity that, that we have uh, right now. Yeah, I think the timing right now is excellent because there's enough traction that you know there's going to be work, but it's still new enough that there's still alpha if you start early. Yeah, I like, uh, yeah, what I want to mention, like uh, this, uh, there's a set of videos on YouTube by Ars Technica, it's called The War Stories. And basically talks about these uh, developers in the 80s. There's uh, the guy that made Ultima. There's a, uh, there's a great story about Crash Bandicoot and the Naughty Dog. There were basically a two people studio at the time. And uh, that's really what I feel like uh, uh, the opportunity in this space is, is an opportunity where you could be either alone or a small team. And uh, it's really just about uh, uh, kind of really following your passion because uh, it's, uh, there, there's so much potential to, to all of these aspects that I feel like uh, uh, we're really just missing people that uh, kind of just want to build something and uh, they want to make it great. And so I feel like you can literally point to any topic, you know, like build a better wallet, build a better security monitoring, build the tools to find bugs in contracts, find bugs. You can point at any of those and there's the opportunity for you to be great at that. And you have the, you don't really need as, man, as many resources as, you know, starting your own LLM, type business or, you know, competing against Apple or Microsoft. And so that's what I feel like uh, we have in this space is uh, we see the opportunity and at the same time, it's achievable by uh, smaller teams and it's achievable by bootstrappers. Yeah, I think there's two things in the space that are extremely beautiful for lack of a better word. And one is how endless it is. You can just learn and be nerds nine forever and there's never going to be a shortage of things that you can dig into and once you deploy your first contract and you use it with some sort of coin or token or whatever it's just for me at least it was kind of like a breakthrough moment where it's like whoa i just this is just literally programmable bunny like this shit is hectic yeah I feel like, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess I'll tell you, um, I had that, um, uh, do you remember when uh, Polygon started doing liquidity mining? Not exactly when, but yeah, I have a vague recollection. I think it was uh, maybe early 2021, maybe it was like February, March 2021, something like that. But basically, that was when I was doing a few hackathons and I basically, I remember doing like my first big hackathon was the Chainlink uh, hackathon. And I remember just getting absolutely crushed where when I started the hackathon, I was like, okay, I'm gonna just do, you know, free projects and I'm going to basically, you know, win a ton of bounties. And then I actually just got uh, crushed and I lost and I, you know, uh, I failed basically. And, uh, but, but what I did is I kept doing a bunch of hackathons uh, via Gitcoin, EVE Global, etc. And uh, in, uh, in doing those, I basically was forced uh, not only to build smart contracts, but I knew that if I like deployed them and uh, you know, made them into actual products, 
uh, I was more likely to win and I was, was also more likely to learn something. And so what I did is I built like a, a smart contract that will basically farm Matic on Aave via leverage. <laughs> and that's what I built. And basically I, I, I just uh, then added like a UI that will track all of the rewards, etc. Because I because I really wanted to understand that stuff uh, and um, there's like there's like super niche resources if you if you look deep enough about this type of uh, arbitrage they used to call it you know just arbitrage now you would call it MEV but um, I was really fascinated with understanding that because I also knew that by building something like that I would I would have been able to uh, to to learn the skill you know versus trying to build whatever like uh, you know tutorial number twelve. Uh, about uh, you know something I wasn't ever gonna use, and so th that's really how I got uh, started uh, building stuff. And um, that, yeah, I feel like in, in using that tech uh, for something that I wanted to figure out, uh, I, I I was able to learn it, and then I, I was able to leverage it to to effectively get a job uh, uh, by that as well. So for beginners, you recommend joining hackathons and trying to build something is definitely a better way to learn than just taking tutorials or just lectures. Yeah, I would say, I mean, the, the funny thing is like, if you check my Twitter, you'll see that like I have a, um, my banner is me playing squash. And that's because that's what I used to do. I used to teach people how to play squash. And so when you, when you teach people how to learn, you basically learn about this concept called flow. And flow is the idea that if something is too easy, you get bored and if something is too complex, you get intimidated. And so my advice is that if you're not going to get intimidated, you should always only do things where you're going to fail publicly and you're going to win big. Uh, but then you have to also look at your own personality and your own uh, uh, position in life, you know, in terms of emotional resilience and in terms of time. And so not everybody can start by doing an hackathon. But I feel like after maybe, you know, a couple months of building something where you you did a couple tutorials, you did a couple of things, you should compete immediately. And then there's the, I guess the other side of the discussion is also if you're going to do security research, we saw a lot of talent that basically is not, they're not developers. They just found kind of their own edge in terms of logical reasoning or, you know, gotchas or they have like a list of bugs that they understand a little bit better than everybody else. And so like to become somebody like that you don't really need to learn anything you just go and you grind it out uh, publicly uh, but you know to grind it out publicly is a test uh, of uh, re emotional resilience because i'm i'm sure you can relate but you know it's not pleasant to be last at every competition you participate in and you know to lose 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 that that can take a toll on you so you want to balance it out with uh, you know things that keep you engaged uh, or you know easy wins so uh, that's that's more of a personal uh, decision though it depends on your own uh, character and for someone looking to balance it out how would you recommend they do that because let's say they are trying to do quarter in a contest but they're not getting the traction that they want to what do you suggest they do to just counter that yeah and that's uh, that's there's another great book it's called uh, the winner effect and this is the idea that uh, basically if you take a, a wrestler, uh, no, a boxer and you have them fight against a weaker opponent, uh, they actually end up fighting better at the real match because wins, no matter how small, stack up. That's basically the idea. And so that's really what you want to do is like, you cannot just lose in life, right? Let's say your life is just your job and you're just going to fail endlessly. You're going to have a miserable life. But maybe you have, you know, you, maybe you're doing really well uh, in your, on your emotional side or maybe you're traveling. And so you can afford to actually lose all these contests because it's not going to hit you emotionally. So that's one way. Or the other way could be that you balance it out where you basically uh, compete a little bit and then perhaps you do some gig work or perhaps you go and you, you teach even though you're not that good. You, uh, and there's ways to teach when you're not that good. And it's just say, prefacing everything by saying, I'm still learning, here's what I'm learning, right? You can always teach others by uh, being honest. And so basically by doing that or, or, or a combination of that, you end up finding some win in some way, which could be uh, uh, positive feedback by people, or it could be that you get some gigs, or it could be that you have a second job, or it could be that you're you know, happy for other reasons. 
And so you end up balancing it out so that you're not fully miserable. Uh, however, uh, you will like if you if you kind of look at uh, uh, from a long enough perspective, you still have to take enough losses over time. It's just you have to decide how intense that experience has to be, and you, and you can decide if you want to take you know a ton of losses early and learn fast, or if you want to just uh, spread those out over time. Because uh, you know at the end of the day, nobody can take away the skill, right? In finding bugs, in doing that process, in being uh, thorough in uh, questioning everything. So the skill will will be achieved no matter what. It's just you want to decide how you want to relate to that. And um, to keep things mixed, you will do a little bit of learning where you look at something that uh, perhaps inspires you or it keeps you going. I feel like uh, there's a bunch of uh, authors that are great there or like uh, you, you eventually find kind of your developers. Like I have a list of people that I follow that uh, I wouldn't necessarily do what they do, but I feel like it's great to learn from them or at least be inspired. And then on the other side, you, you would uh, just do the pure uh, job side of just, you know, grinding contests and uh, participating, which is the thing that will give you wins because that's how you win. But then everything else you do it so that you're, you, you're happy in doing it or you're satisfied in doing it because uh, you don't want to be miserable in uh, yeah, there's no really no point in uh, making your life miserable over uh, some random contest. If, yeah, you know, and if I think even sense. doing CTFs can be a great way to offset that because they're usually easier, and you get a sense that you're progressing. Because at the at the start, you know, you don't know how to do CTFs, but then there's a lot of resources out there, and if you get really stuck, you can like figure it out and that can build your confidence as well over time so you're not just constantly just losing 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 yeah i would uh, personally I'm, i wouldn't recommend doing ctfs to become good in uh, security research because i feel like uh, if just if you like if you chart out statistically the number of bugs and number of exploits that have happened it's like a third of the exploits are that the admin forgot to initial initialize the contract Another third was basically them using vault tokens on NLP uh, position on a uh, on a landing protocol, and then the the, the remaining third is like miscellaneous uh, uh, configuration bug, math bug, etc. Uh, or things that was missed. And so from my experience, I feel like CTFs are always way more complicated than uh, real uh, security research. Whereas uh, CTFs, they're all the flashy stuff, like the crazy complex stuff, the, you know, the memory injection type thing that uh, in reality really happens, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, once every year, maybe once on a career for, for most people. So I feel like uh, uh, th th I would say that's great to be inspired. And I feel like if you check the paradigm uh, CTF of last year, they had a couple of great uh, things. One of them was... Um, they did like a um, OX Monaco project where you had uh, to basically race your cars. And I thought that was like really cool because they just introduced it live and they're like, okay, now every hacker is gonna PVP on chain and basically you have to learn how to, to code this, uh, this, uh, this car and, you, and you're gonna go and do it. And, um, and I thought that was, that was a great moment. And then uh, the other stuff is really just about, uh, you know, clever engineers, uh, you know, uh, Arlie the dog comes to mind. It was an early Codorina uh, warden, you know, it goes by the name uh, Alterus, is a lead uh, researcher at Spearbit. And um, he did like a very interesting puzzle about uh, yield farming vaults and leveraging re-entrancy and that type of stuff, which in my opinion, you would never see in the real world. Because if, if a project creates like a quick re-entrancy bug, People are just gonna exploit that versus you know exploiting a more complex uh, uh, scenario. Yeah, I think that's a great distinction to make that not all CTFs are made equal, and you should definitely not focus on doing CTFs for the sake of doing CTFs. Just like you mentioned, they're not gonna progress your skill further. Um, I was mainly talking about beginner CTFs like Ethernode and perhaps then vulnerable DeFi. But as the level of skill gets higher and higher, you know, there's not much, uh, the, the, there's definitely diminishing returns into doing CTFs for sure. Yeah. And I will say the, as, as, as you get better, the things you, you want to check to learn become more esoteric. 
where like maybe you're gonna go and read you know staking contracts or maybe you're gonna go and read the GAF uh, source code or uh, you're going to read about uh, how other blockchains are coded and exploits that couldn't even happen in the EVM because you're basically trying to kind of find the, that uh, inspiration uh, that helps you look at things in a different way because you know at the end of the day the funny thing about all of these competitions is all of the bugs are in the code but it's you that is changing in, in being able to find them so it's really about the your process is about changing you in order to find things that were already there and so you know that that's the fascinating aspect of it yeah i think it's a great way to think about it that it's all a matter of your perspective and the combination of your perspective and your knowledge and you know of course the more knowledge you have the better it is but you also need a better perspective otherwise you can't use that knowledge to the best of your ability so it's almost like a two two heads of skills that you have to consistently upgrade one is your perspective on the code and how you're looking at it and the knowledge itself that you fundamentally need to have to be able to make the best use of this perspective that you have Yeah, and then uh, there's kind of this uh, kind of magical uh, final aspect, which we can call like inspiration, which is, uh, you can call it luck, I guess, but it's basically that sometimes some people find things that other people are not thinking about, and you can have kind of the same background, the same ideas, etc. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, sometimes one person is more inspired than the other, and uh, uh, they just end up finding something else. Uh, although I feel like, what I'm seeing from uh, other bug bounties platforms, such as let's say Hatstop Finance, I feel like what I see is that if you follow like a specific process, maybe maybe it's gonna take you longer in terms of actually finding the bugs, but I feel like everybody that follows the same process ends up getting kind of the same results in terms of how deep they go in terms of let's say math, uh, invariance, etc. And so it's crazy how we can have like completely different backgrounds but if we kind of do the same things, we end up finding the same stuff. And so the, I guess that's uh, the, 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 the final challenge is in being able to have a process and then being able to get rid of that process to actually find something that you wouldn't normally find. And because um, otherwise we will, we will basically end up be replacing by bots, right? All the bots are gonna find all of the safe transfer stuff, all of the re-entrancy stuff, all of the accounting stuff. And so it's, it's only in the things that cannot be fully reproduced that we can have kind of a more uh, human impact. Yeah, I think that's where the creativity comes into play. And that's what makes the big difference between good auditors and excellent auditors is just having that extra bit of creativity that allows you to bend certain scenarios and think of things that are at the moment, really non obvious. And then after you think of it, it's just obvious just because of this one insight that you had. Yeah, that's the other side of, um, the, like one aspect of uh, security contest is really the distinction between being able to come up with an exploit, like actually figuring it out versus just being able to recognize it. And I feel like a lot of frustration is there because once, like, you know, once the con contest is over and just see what everybody else sent, you're like, oh no, I, I could have found that, right? Because you're like, oh yeah, obviously, like it's obvious, but the issue is you, you didn't, uh, you know, you didn't think about it when it, when it mattered. And so, but, but that, that goes back to the idea of being frustrated because once you have enough frustration there, you, you will take kind of that, uh, that the pain and use it for, for a lesson, for learning. And so you're never gonna make that mistake again. And so I feel like if you do enough of those mistakes where you're like, you know, I should have won this competition, I should have found this stuff, and you end up not finding it, um, you eventually just learn because you, 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 know, you just made all the possible mistakes. And so you, you're not gonna make them again. Yes, yes. And another skill that people need to develop as well is speaking the right contest. And they can be challenging when there's like multiple contests going at the same time. So what do you recommend auditors do to pick the best the content for themselves? Stuff. Yeah, I'm going to tell you something really spicy about uh, picking a contest. 
But basically, you have to understand where you stand in the hierarchy. Like, are you the best? Like, are you gonna win? That, that's my advice. Like, you're gonna say to yourself, am I going to win and why? Or am I not gonna be able to beat, you know, person X, person Y, or whatever? And so I feel like that's the, the, the meta, is that uh, basically all the top uh, uh, wardens know that uh, based on who does what, they're going to end up uh, kind of interfering with one another. And so they will naturally tend to orientate towards things where they already have kind of more control. And so if you're going to, you know, uh, rush in as the newbie or a new auditor, you just have to not care, just ignore everything, just do your own thing and ignore everybody else. Whereas if you're already more established, I feel like you, you already know what contest you're going to do based on who else is going to compete. Because, you know, in Sherlock, you can tell, for example, or you already know the associations, etc. And then um, the other thing is going to be deciding based on EV, which is simply the idea that, uh, you know, if a contest pot has a certain size, you can, uh, 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 you can like, based on your own skill and your confidence with the code base, because the code base could be a fork or it could be something where you're really strong or something where they use the same uh, framework, for example, so you're really comfortable with that. And so based on that, you can apply an expected value of uh, the amount of money that you can win. And so that can also help you choose because let's say you can win, I don't know, uh, let's say you're going to crush a contest, but it's a small contest, then the expected value could be lower than doing a bigger contest. Uh, but then uh, it really depends on, you know, the also the reputation that you could get or if you want to win. And so that's, that's I guess, the, the last piece is if you want to decide if you want to maximize for profit or if you want to maximize for glory. And so I guess that's the, the third piece. Yeah, I think that's great advice. As you get more familiar with the competitors and who is doing what, it's great to see where you're in the sort of like the pack hierarchy and trying to see, you know, let's say trust is doing the, this contest you know he's gonna do really well so is it worth your time and if you're just going for profits you might think oh maybe statistically speaking i might be better off doing something else but from a learning perspective you know he's gonna have really good findings so it might be in your benefit to take the contest and then look at his findings to see where you miss things yeah I would say there's like there's a point where it like it if if you're just competing for this one contest then you're kind of missing the point that you're supposed to be competing for like for the long term and so like if, if you're going to audit every single uh, fork of a popular project let's say a Uniswap v3 fork now that Uniswap has become uh, open source like you know that you're not doing it to audit the one fork you know that you're setting yourself up for the future. And so that's, that's something you wanna keep in mind is that you're really sharpening the skill. And then the other thing is you, you wanna kind of uh, get into the brains of these auditors, of the top people. You wanna really ask yourself what they're doing and how they're doing it. Uh, because to be honest, they will have, like everybody will eventually stop being that good. Like that's just the reality. Because to be that good, you have to work a lot. And to work a lot means to sacrifice other aspects of your life. And so eventually everybody's going to quit, like make no mistake about it. Everybody's going to burn out eventually. And so it makes sense to also keep track of your colleagues or, you know, your opponents in that end, because eventually people are just going to stop uh, trying as hard for, you know, maybe they're established, maybe they're happy with where they are. Maybe they stop caring, maybe they stop competing. Uh, and a great example is Watchpad, which I feel like is like one of the best uh, small teams there is and yet you don't hear about them anymore, right? Back when they came to Code Arena, they crushed everything. We all thought they were gonna reach uh, Christoph in the top number one of the leaderboard. They got a bunch of business and they're gone. You know, like uh, why, you know, why uh, expose yourself to such a, a level of uh, competition, frustration, uncertainty, when you can basically, you know, run your own business and have better certainty and also keep uh, uh, peace of mind. And so I feel like, you, you, you want to understand that hierarchy, but you also want to keep in mind that this hierarchy is going to change very rapidly over time. Like it's like a, uh, every season is like three months at most. 
like we you should look at each season as three months and every three months people are rotating because who, who's gonna you know work tw 20 uh, you know 18 hours a day for more than three months you know and call it like a, a good lifestyle you know nobody's gonna do that people are gonna eventually burn out yeah no it is really taxing it's not something you can keep doing for a long period of time yeah so that's what uh, what i will say like if you want to find kind of the like I, I'm not gonna tell you exactly the trick that I use, but what I will say is that you wanna understand that uh, uh, even the top wardens can make mistakes and you know participate in a contest when they shouldn't, for example. And so anytime you notice that, that actually increases your EV, even though there is a top warden competing, because maybe they are burning themselves out and you know that. And when, when you know that, that gives you an edge uh, at that level. Although I will say more more conventional hedge is simply working with a similar code base so let's say if i look at my own work i worked mostly in uh, yield farms uh for a couple of years and so anytime there's kind of yield harvesting the idea of integrating with other protocols for yield that's where i'm gonna find my own edge and so that's where i'm gonna be drawn to because uh, uh it's just gonna be a lot easier you know the first three days where you need to understand something mm -hmm. i have them by default i already know what's going on i can jump right into the details yeah, and that's another important topic that I think you touch on a few times that you need to find out what your edge is or what your uniqueness is as an auditor, see where your strength lies and try to lean in on that when it comes to the contest time. Yeah, that's that's really it. I feel like um, like something that uh, is really interesting and, and I'll suggest you, you go and uh, meet some of these uh, poker players that are tied to crypto because that, that's something that is like, I feel like it's not like it, it's something that keeps happening where there's a lot of people that are into poker that are also into crypto because basically like it, there's something about poker that teaches you about the expected value about doing the best with what you have, about taking opportunities and taking risks in a calculated way. And I feel like that we have a lot to learn there. And uh, uh, recently there was a, a great YouTube series about, uh, I don't remember the name of the guy, but the guy basically uh, started counting cards in actual uh, casinos. And basically talks about his thought process of actually you know, making six figures as a c card counter. And, uh, and I feel like every security research that is decent could have been a count card counter. Uh, it's just the, the actual value, the realized value of card counting is not as high as the one of bug bounties, so I don't recommend it, but it's a great thought exercise because at the end of the day, the casino is the competition, right? The casino is the contest, and then you have the dealer, the hands, other people, and then you have like the odds, I guess. And so what, what I'm trying to say here is that you basically want to wanna not only play to your hedge, but you want to play to your expected value, meaning that you want to do things that are going to be good for you, such as building your own code snippets, improving your ability of explaining uh, uh, exploits or writing reports. You want to become fast at doing that. And then you want to be fast at finding bugs. And uh, you want to trust that over time, you're going to be better at it. And so your uh, realized value, as in the actual wins, are going to be as good as your expected value, which is how good you think you are. And so as long as you understand that uh, sometimes you're going to be lucky and sometimes you're going to be unlucky. But as long as you commit to a process that keeps you honest, because if you lose, you lose. And if you win, you win. And so you, you keep reviewing that. And at the same time, as long as you keep doing those actions, then now you're basically, it's literally as if you put yourself in the river. As long as you don't uh, uh, drown, you're part of the of the fish of the school, uh, fish of school. And so you're going to survive as long as you can uh, avoid drowning. And uh, now you're, you, you know, you, because being a security researcher has a certain expected value, now you're part of that. And so it's really about understanding in a way that the decision of, uh, of which industry you're in and then what you're going to do inside of that industry is a lot more important sometimes than the more micro decisions of, you know, am I going to find every bug, etc. Because at the end of the day, if we all survive and uh, the space grows, we're all going to be in an amazing uh, position either way. And so... I feel like that's something to, to, to keep in mind. And then on the micro level of every contest, uh, you just want to trust that, again, the process will get you there, even though you, you, know, you, you may have a really bad, uh, you know, bad beat and you get really unlucky. 
and you know every finding gets disputed every qa and you get 200 bucks on the qa whatever you know you can you can still um trust that eventually it's gonna it's gonna work out so for someone that's on this process of trying to improve working those 18 hours a day trying to make to the top of the, of the leaderboard what is your advice for them to grow their business okay so and th that's actually something really interesting i mean the first thing i will say there is whether it actually whether you actually want to be popular or or not because because like there's there's a famous article by tim ferris about basically becoming popular is the dumbest thing you can do because he makes the example that if you take you know if you take a thousand people like a small town or like say 50 people uh, 50,000 people a small town how likely is it for uh, for there to be like a crazy person maybe there's one person that is crazy but let's say you do the same thing on a city such as new york city how likely is it that there's like a, a crazy person i don't know for each neighborhood or something like that and so what about the internet what about a place uh, such as twitter where quoting somebody smarter than me, you basically got nothing to gain and everything to lose just in exposing yourself. And so I think that's the first step is really, do you, do you wanna be popular or do you wanna get business? Because you don't have to be particularly uh, known to have a business that is solid because you can just talk to people privately, get referrals privately, and you can, you can live like a really, uh, let's say calm, apparently uh, you know, nothing happens on the surface type life and you can still have an amazing business so that's something that i feel like nobody teaches it's like no you have to be you know super popular uh, build your funnel you know 10, all followers yeah that's that's absolutely just one way of doing it and it's the hardest way right like i actually was taught a lot of business stuff and, and, and i actually took like uh I work with coaches and I got taught this stuff. And like the simplest way to, to make money in a business is to talk to a single person. Like, why would you do a funnel to talk to a thousand people to, you know, engage with them? And so once you understand that, then you just want to kind of figure out what, what your strengths are in terms of uh, results, in terms of your skill and in terms of social proof. And so it goes back to what you're building in doing the contest. So as long as you're, you know, you're, you're, showing yourself in contest and you're placing yourself in a decent spot well now you have social proof of your of your ability to to win and so then it's just a matter of uh, uh you know exposing yourself to more frustration in talking to people that are going to tell you that they don't want to do business with you and as long as you can tolerate that eventually you'll find people that are interested uh and especially if you're uh, i guess like if you're a short-term scammer that's also works like i'm not going to deny that a lot of scammers get a lot of business but if you're like a long-term person where you're actually going to do a good job and you work out of like you understand what the best interest of your customer is and you make sure that it works then eventually you're going to just have a base of people that want to work with you and uh, uh this entire idea goes away although from my experience you always want to be prospecting in anything you do in life whether it's your own company you want to hire more people all the time so that you don't get negotiated by the people you're working with and in terms of business you want to be prospecting on the side all the time so that sometimes some opportunity comes and you can seize it uh just like you know it's like having a, a kind of a second life bar or like a a, a reserve of snacks like you can mm -hmm. always pick a new snack so that you have more opportunities when you feel like it right so on one side you have someone like Pashov that has more than ten thousand followers and that's how he gets his business he tweets informational content and that's how he gets leads and how would the implementation that you're referring to so being more low-key being more on the downside work how does that look in practice like if i want to apply that what are the steps yeah. that i need to take yeah I, and i feel like uh first of all you want to learn why the passion model works i feel like uh like it's 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 actually really clever but basically like a post that says how much money you made how many findings you found uh, how many customers you work with that's called social proof and then you would say that's building in public where i'm building my business in public i'm sharing my experience so that's the context but what you're truly doing is you're showing the social proof of the fact that it's working people are happy and uh, uh you basically you can you can join the roller coaster and the roller coaster will go on no matter what so that's what is happening there and so the way you will do it more privately 
is you would want to use the, the same idea of the social proof, but you don't necessarily want to wave it to, you know, to, to everybody. You're simply going to share it when it matters. And so I guess my personal advice is you want to be, you want to be excessively bragging on paper and then in person, you want to be humble because if I, if I said the same thing to you on a private call, when I'm trying to sell you something, I'm going to sound like an asshole. But at the same time, it sometimes is useful to, you know, drop kind of the, the, the extra information as a way to, to, to again, demonstrate that you can uh, uh, do good uh, about your promise. Uh, but I guess, I guess I'll explain to you how I got a ton of customers in uh, kind of consulting. And so, and I feel like that's a great lesson because uh, that's how basically how I got uh, to, to have like a business where I can work how many, how many hours I want, make as much money as I want in a way. And at the same time, I didn't have to have like any schedule or whatever. I could just travel the world and do that. And I personally did it through Code Mentor, but you can do it through Facebook, Twitter, whatever. You just have to have a bunch of people that uh, are interested in what you do. And so the example on Twitter is crypto Twitter. The example on Facebook is like a Facebook group. And the example of Code Mentor is that Code Mentor is like a website where there's only people looking for coders. And so people are already looking for you. And so the way that works is people will send like a message about uh, like a help request where they're like, I need the help with, uh, I don't know, my, my code doesn't compile. It says, you know, ERC 20 balance exceeds uh, uh, supply, something like that. And my personal advice, the method that works for me has been that what I will tell them is I will tell them the secret. I will message them and tell them in order to fix your bug, we have to figure out if it's an issue with the allowance, if it's an issue with the transfer, if it's an issue with the approve. And then once we figure that out, we're going to see the next error and then we're going to debug it and then we're going to continue. And then at the end of the whole thing, I will say something like, do you want me to take a look? Uh, or, or I would always ask a question. Basically, I will tell them what I will do to help them. And then I would ask them a question so that it's clear that they have to reply. And uh, what happens is, especially if you like look like an average person like me, you have like exactly average open rate where people open and check your message on an average way. But what happens is the people that actually read your message because you wrote them a message that is custom to them, they all reply. It's like you have like an insane retention rate, whereas you have a very small acquisition rate because people don't see the same value because it's not flashy. And so that's that's kind of how it goes, where at the beginning you have to do a little bit more work and be a little more generous at the beginning to convince people that you got the thing. And then once they understand they got you got the thing, most people uh, are rational and they basically just work with you endlessly and they send you more business, etc. And so it becomes really a matter of having that flow where in some way you are generating these opportunities to effectively uh, onboard new people to work with you. And then uh, you're still delivering a really high quality product. But the difference is you're not building your own funnel. You're just using another funnel that exists because for you to build your own funnel, it's uh, really a, it's like, a, it's a different uh, level of game. Like you're playing to build an agency where you could just get started by literally just calling uh, or going to an event and talking to 20 people instead of you know having to do the entire thing. And so it really depends what your end outcome is, but at the same time, you just want to be pragmatic about it. Like if you want to get, if you want to get a job today, you don't need to be popular. You don't need to do anything particularly complex. You just have to find somebody that needs you and you have to demonstrate that they, they would actually be happier working with you. And then you just want to make sure that they're happy with their decision at the end. And that's really all you got to do. And what platforms or medium channels would you recommend people use for approaching or prospecting clients? Well, I, I think in our case, Twitter is obviously the, the best place. Like uh, all projects are going to be there. And so that, that's where I will start. I will start by looking in Twitter. And then I would go and uh, talk to people, but most people will talk to you on Telegram or on Discord. And so that, that's how you will do it. Although from my experience, or at least personally, let's say you want to work with me as the customer, I'm not going to work with anybody that, that is not a referral because in crypto, there's so many scams. And so that's something you want to keep in mind is that, you know, the trigger happy person that sends you the copy paste, that's not what I'm saying that you should do. 
What I'm saying that you should do is you actually figure out what people need and then you, you, you offer them something customized. And so, and the additional way to do it even better is you get a referral that refers you to this customer. And so in our case of the Colorina example, you, the, the best example is you do a great job with a contest and maybe you win it, maybe you're in the top three, and then you just reach out to the sponsor and you talk to them about their needs. And that's good. like you basically everything I told you boils down to that because you show them that you already are good at the code at the job. They know that they're good, that you're not just good, you're good exactly at what they need because you've demonstrated it and you already have a, a introduction basically and you just uh, you just have to you know not fuck it up at that point. You, you're already ready to win. Yeah, I think that's great advice and I think focusing on building relationships can go a long, long way. You might not have a uh, immediate return, but you never know on the opportunities that may arise from those relationships in the long term. So you might start out with someone that, you know, at the moment they don't really have a need for your skills or they're, you know, busy with another project, but you should never, you know, discard a possibility with, of that person coming back to you in the future. Yeah, I, I would say I wouldn't I, like I wouldn't be as generous with my time in that sense. I feel like if like like basically I will never get into a call unless I'm selling you something. That's basically it. Or you're paying me already. Like I feel like you want to have like a threshold for things. Like I get random messages by actually really interesting people. But unless it gets to that point where we know that there's going to be an exchange of money or an exchange of money already happened, we're never going to get on a call because why would we waste, you know, 20 minutes before, 30 minutes in the middle and then 20 minutes after of distractions versus just sending some messages. And so you want to, what I'm saying as the end goal is you want to make it so that that's part of what you do especially if you're like in a small team or you're solo, you still have to be able to do a great job. And so you want to work on that. And then you want to be able to present your job well. And so you want to keep doing that. And then you also want to be prospecting. And so that's something that you balance out. But at the same time, um, once you understand kind of those three aspects of uh, promoting your business, fulfilling your business and retaining your customers, you basically have built a business. And so for you to one day change it and go into an actual uh, organization or to turn your own business into an organization, that's very natural because you understand all of the aspects that have to be done. And the plant dies if, if you don't have all three, right? Because if you're bad, people are going to be mad and you're going to have to refund them. If you treat people like shit, nobody wants to engage with you after until they get what, because people will work with you if you're the only option and then they will never call you back. So I'm not gonna, like you, you're not gonna lose customers, but you're not gonna keep them. And then if you don't never talk to anybody new, obviously nobody knows you exist. And so that, that's dead as well. But, but that, that was my, kind of my lesson was in, uh, in doing the squash stuff, which I have like a YouTube channel, but basically it's like, you really don't need to overcomplicate things uh, when, you, when you start, to be honest. Like you, you can literally just, go direct, direct path towards what you want. I want a job, I'm gonna basically apply. I want a customer, I'm gonna to talk to customers. And then, and you do that, and then you make it grow. And that's the same thing they teach you in startup school. There's a Y Combinator startup school, is a great uh, video series on YouTube. But basically that's what they teach you. Talk to your customers, they, they will tell you what they want, try and sell them. If, if they say that they want something, and when you sell them, they say no, that means that they don't actually want what, you, what you're building. So that's when you get to the truth. And then once you, once you understand that and you have the balls to, to actually do that, then uh, you can do a business on anything else, you know, change context, change product, but the, the underlying rules are the same. And how do you manage your time between all those hats that you have to wear? Yeah, I would say poorly. That's the first step. It's uh, it's uh, it's really hard to to do the especially the prospecting, especially if you're like more of a like a, like like my favorite time of the day is the morning where I don't have to talk to anybody. I open up the code base, I open up the Miro board and I just find bugs. Right? It's it's like it's awesome. Especially the first two hours of the day, I'm super focused. I just, maybe I have the ideas that I had from the day before and I'm just gonna attack, attack, attack. And like, I'm, you know, we're paid to solve crossword puzzles, basically. It's, it's amazing, it's an amazing job. 
right? It really is a beautiful job, especially because it's challenging, it changes, etc. And that's what I what I really enjoy. And then once you start talking to people, because you have like I've got a day a day job, and then I got the gigs that I'm doing and people that I'm talking to, it gets it just gets messier. But at the end of the day, you want to keep in mind that there's a time to ship the product. And shipping the product, that's something that you learn through hackathons or through actual startups. It's like there's a time where you have a bunch of ideas about what you want and you're just going to cut, 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 cut until you can have something that is great. And that's the only thing you're going to present because presenting like something great and a third on top of it, people will just look at the third, right? Mm -hmm. So you just polish what is good and you cut out anything else. But um, uh, yeah, you just have to balance it and it's... Uh, it's uh, I guess it is what it is. You just make it work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think it depends on the priorities at the moment. It depends on what cycle you are. For example, if you have, you know, a lot of clients, you might be focused more on like delivering. And then um, once you are at the end of that delivery, you might start looking more towards prospecting again and just keeping, just being mindful of that cycle. It's a good way to yeah. kind of handle it without being super... Um, without overthinking it yeah i would say that uh i mean especially in uh in uh, relations in general like every time your people know that like you have an agenda or you need to close or whatever you're gonna have a hard time so that's something to keep in mind that the best time to get your next customer is when you have too many because you're gonna be a dick you're gonna ask for more money you don't care that's the best time to get the next customer and that's kind of why you know, sales becomes a job in it of itself, where like you can have the crappiest product, but like, if you have like a great charismatic CEO that can sell, the company will still go because at least you have the the coal, like you, you're feeding the coal to the furnace and the thing's still burning, even though it burns poorly, it's still burning, so it works. And so that's something to keep in mind is that um, just sales is, is a very important skill. Although what, I've, what, I, what I feel like, at least from my perspective, is that like if you get to a point where you're pretty confident with the things you can achieve in terms of businesses, you know, like you can, we can all go sell ads on Facebook, you know, do the Shopify thingy, like all this crap. I feel like um, what I what I saw it is it is very rare to to be able to perform like professionally at a certain level because that actually requires genuine sacrifice versus more of this flashy stuff that most people will, will, the problem for most people is they will always only do the skill. So they feel like the, they never have the sales, but I can assure you that if you force yourself to learn sales, you're going to learn that it's actually just being normal with people and talking. It's literally not a, the end of the world. And so for, from my perspective, I feel like it's a lot more engaging to just uh, focus on the skill. And as your skill grows, everything else will come with it because the, the amount of people that are better than you decreases, the amount of uh, uh, the quality of the work that you can offer increases, especially compared to the overhead. Because imagine having to compete with, I don't know, a hundred people team or stuff like that. They're going to charge so much more that you charging a ton compared to your costs is still going to be cheap to other people because your own productivity has increased. And so from my perspective, because we're in the in one of the few spaces where you can have the 10,000x developer. You don't have the 100x, you have the 10,000x developer. If you focus on your own productivity and you just add a pinch of social skills and sales, you're going to be fine. And then you get to decide whether you want to play, you know, the, let's call it the shop game. I'm going to shop it and market it or whatever. I'm going to do all the content or whether you just want to focus on the skill. That's something that you get to decide, uh, uh, luckily. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Just being transparent and let the work talk for itself. Yeah, I will go as far as to say that uh, like most of the jobs I've gotten, especially in the past, I, I never was qualified for them. Like, uh, and, and to be like, one thing I, I said jobs, but what I mean with jobs is always gigs because I've always worked like on an hourly rate or like a retainer. But, but what I mean is that like, let's say you're like a random founder that needs to build a landing page and you have 20 days to do it because you need to raise and you don't have no time. Like 
what are the what how, how more desperate are you in accepting like just the first random asshole that is going to work their ass off right that's that's the reality is because if people like there's there's so many people that promise a lot but that they're not willing to actually put in the effort whereas if you're actually willing to put in the effort people will know after a day they're like oh shit this guy is underselling themselves but they actually have the skill i'm gonna treat them treat them nicely and we're gonna keep working for a while right and so that that's that has been my experience is that as long as you're you can be super honest you can be unqualified and because you're willing to put in the extra effort people will appreciate that because you were honest up front where you're like i didn't do like i don't know i never audited like a zk sync project or like a zk project i never audited it but whatever i'm gonna try my best and this is what i'm gonna try and do and if i can't do it i'm gonna advise you to talk to these people and i'll find the next person for you and so as long as you have that type of honesty and then you put in the effort um you know most people that are reasonable and they have uh, a need for for somebody like you will will engage with you yeah i i love what you said um when you started talking about this that saves a lot of time into trying to get clients and just gives a lot of overhead when you're trying to like not overhead in sense of practical overheads but like mental overhead when you're trying to negotiate and trying to you know see oh how can i sell him or how can i make this argument better so i can yeah. get, get a better rate so i think that that advice it's it's really good advice i'll give you i'll give you a quote like if you can't close in the dms you're not gonna close on the zoom call that's the reality and so if you're not set up in a way where the person that you're talking to has already decided like you're you're all wasting your time and so that's just the reality of it is like there's the joke of you know the million dollar client is like okay thank you send the money and you know the ten dollar client is like no bro you need to refund me blah 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 it, it's it's true it's exactly like this people that are let's call it sufficiently desperate because they need something done fast and you pose yourself as the expert that is honest and is gonna do a great job it just it just works really well like because uh, there's like the the famous uh, triangle of freelancing is you can have it uh, high quality fast or cheap and you you can only have two of these and so in this industry we're choosing to be fast and high quality but to cost a lot and that's basically what you align with and if you it, and that works really well for small uh, businesses because any small business that tries to do a lot for cheap it's just somebody miserable. It's just a miserable life, you know? Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned doing some interesting work at Badger and going from launch to deployment and doing some security stuff. Can you walk us through that process? Yeah, and um, I believe we'll, we'll do a talk in the future, like an actual workshop. And maybe one day there will be like a separate uh, video and that's going to be in collaboration with Code Arena. But basically, the, this is like, this is my like a cookie cutter advice for every project is that you want to have developers that are as good as possible at security research as you can, because you will have to challenge your code and rewrite it no matter what. Like that's a guarantee. And you want to start by, by assuming that anything that you didn't test is going to have bugs. What like is is there no test? That means it's gonna be broken 100%. That's a guarantee because that's what's gonna happen. And so the first layer of defense is simply having tests and developers that have an understanding of security and they have an understanding of when to ask for help, basically. So they can add a note, make sure that it's clear that there's something that could go wrong there, so that it gets more exposure there. And then the second layer is we always add the rule of three peer reviewers. So let's say we're launching a new vault, a new strategy for uh, farming Aura or farming CVX or something like that. We would always have at least three people review it before uh, it, it's safe, at least internally. And uh, the three people would always be uh, three people that are not the developer. So there's no bias. The developer cannot review. And then one of them needs to be a lead developer, which me, basically was me or the, let's call it the CTO of Badger. But basically it was a, a highly respected person and then the other two people could have been some more junior roles 
But basically, you always wanted to have a peer review by a, a senior and then two peer reviews by a junior. And the way you do a peer review is you can't just say, looks good to me. Like if you say LGTM, that's, that's not sufficient. And so we even instituted the skip a turn policy where basically if you don't feel like doing the actual work, you're gonna say, okay, I, I can't do it today. I need to take a day off, two day off, and I'm gonna send a review later. But basically you cannot just do a rubber stamp. You actually have to do a proper review. Proper review means you review the coverage, you review the tests, you review the code, you review the integration, you basically go through like a checklist and then you have to explain back to everybody else what the code does, which means that instead of just saying, okay, it's safe because it's safe because, you also have to explain what the code does because maybe the code is safe, but it's actually doing something different. And so we need to understand if there was a miscommunication there. And so that's the internal process. And then after the internal process, we will do the external process, which means we engage with a third party, which could be a, a, a Codorina auditor or Codorina warden or a security shop. And we would always have one of them do a review at that level. And then if it was an actual launch, as in we're actually launching a strategy, let's say the CVX locking strategy, we will also do a Codorina contest on it. Because if it was new code, that's the, the, that would be the next level. Whereas if it's a new product, which is what we're doing with VBTC right now, which is a new product we announced uh, a month or so ago, we would also do a bunch of audits in the middle, which is what we're doing now. We do a bunch of audits, we fix the code, and then we will do the security contest before launching. But basically there's this um, piece in the middle of you know quality assurance. The code is not gonna change drastically, but we know that, we, that it just has to kind of uh, you know, just cook a little bit more so that we find all the bugs that are missing and we have more people look at it in an exponentially growing way where you go, you know, small shop, bigger shop, etc., so that you're not also wasting your money, you know, in just doing big stuff all the time. And then you culminate with the uh, security contest. And then after a security contest, you're gonna do the garden launch with a bug bounty. And uh, currently a bug bounty, we will just do it on Immunify. But uh, I feel like in the future we will do the idea of a bug bounty that I think is ideal will be like an ex, uh, like a growing bug bounty where over time, every day the pot grows and you just make it grow over time. And then eventually you do the more flashy unified type stuff. And so hopefully that, that shows you kind of the, what uh, other people would call the cheese uh, grade model where you have all of these different checks and balances. And uh, that's because what I found, and uh, I think we all know that, but like all of our colleagues and us ourselves, we also eventually burn out. And so that's why you want to make sure that there's redundancy there, because if you know it was a single security uh, uh, process, then the one day you make a mistake, you're done. And so instead you wanna have this extra exposure so that all the mistakes that you make, somebody else can catch. And so it becomes a lot less likely to, to ship in, uh, um, uh, in a dangerous state. And the last thing I will say is that basically kind of my working theory now is that the last thing you do needs to have zero findings. Like you have to do one extra basically, because from my experience, even one extra is not sufficient, but to, to do one extra is, is, is like, is a good starting point. And then you would have like a bug bounty type deal to support it. Uh, uh, to, to support what is the unknown and things that may change uh, in the future. Yeah, I think that this application of layers is the best framework that we have right now for security. It's just layer upon layer upon layer until you feel like you can't place any more layers, you know, until you, you're really having zero findings. That's the the only way to do it. Yeah, I would say that even uh, smaller shops, like if you're a smaller shop, you should be on what, and that, that's obviously that's, you know, me kind of throwing water on my own windmill. But like, I feel like every, like most shops should also advise with doing other security exercises, even doing like a public contest. And then they should just agree with the, with the, with the customer that they're gonna also participate in the contest. Because as a customer, it is in my in my best interest for you to have these ideas marinate in your head and maybe you go do something else you get some inspiration somewhere else but then you come back if anything comes back i gave you an incentive to to help me immediately 
instead of creating this situation where you basically have some information and you're not going to be paid and so you're going to be pissed or whatever and it creates like a scenario that doesn't work whereas if we know that we're doing the exercise we we trust you guys but we also know that you know we can't trust you we have to verify so we have to do further checks etc and then you do some sort of a public uh, event then everybody that already participated in the process can go to the public event and anything that comes to them at that time they can share it then and they can effectively contribute and be uh, and uh, be awarded for it and so i think that works really well uh, for everybody um, you know, because ultimately it avoids the worst case scenario which is an exploit and so uh, going back to the expected value I feel like the security cost is basically the realized value of money that you actually pay to not realize the scenario of losing all of the money in the protocol. That's basically the, the math of it. And so it, go, it really goes hand in hand where the, the bigger TVL you expect, the more you're going to have to invest to, to ensure that it works uh, as intended. Yeah, right. I agree with that. And I know you have some good stories from War Rooms. If you want to share a bit of that with us. Yeah, I, I think I'll, uh, I'll start by sharing like a, a story of what happened. Like, I guess I'll share the story of my first war room. And then one day, one day, maybe we'll share, I'll share another, but uh, I'll share the first war room I went. And uh, basically it was, uh, I think it was 2021. And again, there were the liquidity mining uh, uh, on Aave, but there was also liquidity mining on, uh, on Ethereum. And so what happened was I basically, I got hired by Badger uh, after writing a yield farming strategy that was basically the levered uh, farming strategy on Aave. And uh, what I did is I uh, basically, I wrote a version of that for Yearn. And so it was called the, 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 the wave strategy. But basically we did this, this partner strategy where we as Badger would write the strategy and then Yearn will add the strategy to the uh, to the WBTC vault, which at the time, had, I don't know, maybe $500 million in TVL was like a very sizable TVL. And so um, basically I got the strategy to go through the security process. It went through their, their own process, which basically consists of doing a, a garden launch on a separate website. And then they have multiple people review it and then they do like actual auditors if they feel like they need to. And then they, they launch it with like a capped amount. And I think it got up to maybe $10 million in TVL uh, of the actual TVL from the vault that was used. And then what happened was the way the, way the Yearn vault works is uh, uh, you have multiple uh, functions. One of them is called uh, uh, liquidate position. Another one is called report and basically reports the, the results of a harvest, uh, which uh, a harvest is basically when you get some rewards from, uh, from Aave and you sell them to reinvest them. That's basically what harvest is. But basically what happened was that the way I wrote this code was that when you levered up, you actually ended up taking on, a, like you ended up taking on a little bit of debt and uh, you basically ended up using that debt and uh, uh, telling the vault that that was actually profit. And so the strategy was actually over reporting in profit. And then anytime it had to uh, uh, allow for a withdrawal, it would have to wind down. And in winding down, it would actually report a loss. And so we basically got a call, let's say at like 11 uh, in European time of like, bro, the strategy is calling a loss. What the fuck is going on? War room. Okay, and so it's like, okay, you go into this Telegram chat with like 13 different people and they're like, everybody's sending like uh, tenderly traces or like I don't even remember if they had tenderly at that time there was like some weird way to debug stuff that you had to do and it was like in brownie and you share like a screenshot and they're like the strategy is, is claiming a loss what the fuck is going on right and so what what it turns out and there was um, another developer but basically ended up figuring out that that was the issue. It was that again, it, was, it wasn't actually having a loss. It's simply that it was reporting a gain when it, there was no gain. And so that, that extra gain was triggering the loss. And so what ended up happening was that the, the team realized that if they let the strategy go for like another day, it would actually end up gaining sufficient yield to repay for its debt. And so it would have basically, the, the joke was like it would have redeemed itself the strategy redemption arc type uh, type deal. Uh, however, somebody else from the security team was like, 
you know, kill the strategy, have the multi-sig repay, let's not have it report a loss, and let's just uh, close it and wind it down. Uh, and basically that was kind of the first time that, um, you know, uh, I guess I, I broke something in production, but, uh, and it was a really interesting experience uh, and um, it just shows you how, cause, cause ultimately what happened was like, and I was terri terribly sorry about it. Although I feel, like, I feel like they should have just let the strategy redeem itself, to be honest. But I also was like, uh, basically I was told that it's like, bro, we let you do this. Right, because because at the end of the day, the team had that, like a different level of ownership where they're like, no, bro, we let you do this, and so we are responsible with it because we did the due diligence on your own work. Right, we were supposed to prevent you from breaking it, and so that kind of shows you the type of mentality you need to have in, uh, in this type of security research, where even the like the, the the unfortunate reality is the good intention person is the one that is going to cause the bug. Because you think that the good intentional person is the one that went through the most effort. Like I spent so much time writing all the tests, showing them all the simulation, writing all the reporters. And then you still end up getting a bug because you let your guard down. Whereas if, if they perhaps were more skeptical of my work initially, that perhaps would have been caught because maybe they would have been like, just show me a test of what happens if you harvest after 10 seconds and your reports a loss, right? And so it's really that adversarial mindset uh, that you want. And then, uh, uh, you know, I'm glad that, you know, nothing, nothing bad really happened uh, uh, from that. Yeah, and I think it's important to highlight as well that if you're in the space for long enough, eventually you're going to write something that has a bug in it or you're going to let a bug pass one of your audits. And not being too hard on yourself, it's also important for your longevity in this business. Otherwise, you're just going to burn out more often as well. I will say that's uh, that's something that happens, in my opinion, to most uh, professionals. Is there's the pre-wrecked uh, arc and the post-wrecked arc, where eventually everybody makes a mistake in some way or another. It could be that you miss a bug in an audit. It could be that you write some crappy code. It could be that you get scammed. It could be that like there's a million things that can go wrong. But basically, uh, yeah, it, it really that's that's kind of the the crazy part of this uh, this whole uh, uh, space is that it's so like it, it really feels like all the stuff that we're doing on some level is actually so easy and so simple, and yet there are so many ways to mess it up. Even though if you explain it or if you just look at it uh, after the fact, it feels like it was obvious. It's never obvious when you're doing it because it's such a foreign uh, setup and a foreign system that uh, you really have to, 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 to go the extra mile there. And uh, I, if, like, if I can point to the cause that I feel like is, like it's really just a nerdy thing, but it's like in C, you have the idea of a memory leak, right? Where if you access an aspect of the memory that you're not supposed to, you're gonna get a segmentation fault, unless you do some unsafe stuff that I'm, I've never done in university, basically. My, if, if, you, if you go out the memory, segmentation fault, the thing breaks. Whereas in uh, Solidity, we have a pointer to any memory because uh, state can be accessed in any way. And we can do that through different contracts that can call yourself. And so you, you can effectively enter memory or leak memory in any place at any time in, any, in multiple ways. And so I feel like that's the real challenge is that we basically created a set of uh, systems that not only do not, not only are non-linear because the contract doesn't actually go line by line because it can go back and restart, but it also always points to a memory leak and it always points to an arbitrary array memory, which means that as like, it's just not the same thing that you that you will uh, uh, is literally not the same dimension of how you will look at the program normally. It's it's as if it was a, a three dimensional program in that sense because you have infinite access to arbitrary pointers in memory. Yeah, it 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 actually is really hard if you take everything in consideration. There's a reason why exploits keep happening, and it's just because it's it gets complex. And it's hard to foretell some of these things that, some of the states that end up happening. Um, but we can shift gears a little bit. Is Do you use any protocols currently? I know that is a common 
flat among auditors to be super skeptical around protocols, you know, because after you've done a certain amount of audits, you start to not trust anything out there. So are there any yeah. protocols that you currently use or that you're currently interested in or that you want to see launched that you're excited about? I mean, I would say that I basically have tried almost everything. And I've also had, like, I've also had my Degen uh, uh, period. Funnily enough, I was doing a um, presentation uh, with uh, um, in a Gitcoin hackathon, or maybe it was a ETH Global hackathon, where well, I was presenting with Badger live, literally during the call. And in between that call, Iron Finance went from like a dollar to zero. It was like I literally saw, you know, my Degen uh, tokens just go to zero instantly, and I, and I was literally on a call, so there was nothing I could have done, and I thought I thought that was funny. But uh, and I got wrecked in a bunch of stuff. Like I got wrecked, uh, I think on Scream. I think I got wrecked in some other protocol. Uh, uh, but but yeah, and uh, and and I got wrecked in spite of the fact that I do not interact with anything I don't understand. Like I am the type of person that if the contract is not verified, I will not use it. Like I genuinely will not. Sometimes I like I I'll spend maybe weeks or even months before I give a full approval of a wallet to like even the Cowswap relay or something like that. I'm not gonna, I'm like, I literally will not, I'll just pay the extra gas, I don't care. But uh, but I but I did basically use everything. Like I feel like I've used uh, most lending protocols, most yield protocols. I've tried uh, some of the more leverage, uh, degenerate stuff. Uh, uh, I looked into most of that. I tried to hack most of it, like I, I have like a bunch of projects. One of them was actually Sturdy Finance that I just do, you know, the Garden Angel type deal where you just check on them every uh, X uh, weeks. Uh, and you just see if they change something to see if, you know, the, um, if they, they, they mess something up. And the interesting thing there, if you, if you haven't uh, checked the exploit fully with Sturdy, was that they actually had this reentrancy guard blocker, but they simply didn't have it in one call. And it was actually the one call of the contracts that was the Ave contract, which was out of scope from multiple uh, security exercises. And even myself, I look at my own experience. I basically trusted, you know, the again, I trusted the 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 good willing uh, project that was like, bro, it's audited, it's safe, right? Instead of being like, no, I'm gonna check anyway because I don't trust this uh, assumption of skipping. And so, uh, but yeah, I. Um, I've basically used everything that uh, that I can think of, like any type of swapping, any type of staking, any type of yield farming, any type of degeneracy. I, I really enjoy uh, most of it. And uh, I got to a point, I haven't uh, yet spin up my own yield farm just for myself, where I will literally just build a front end that only I can use, smart contracts that only I can use, uh, because uh, you know, it doesn't make sense in terms of uh, cost. But I feel like I, I will get to a point where I'll start doing that literally just as a project for fun because I, I, I find it really funny, uh, really fun to just kind of find arbitrages in uh, different uh, NFTs or, you know, look at vaults uh, and then check the harvest. And then every project that I look into, I always go and check is their harvest safe, is their vault safe. So every time I interact with something, maybe I also find a bug. So I just get super excited when I start doing that. And that's why I just, uh, I'm all over the place because I just keep looking at uh, this stuff uh, all the time. And do you have any interesting MEV as well? Or are you looking more on the DeFi side of things? I have uh, interesting MEV, but uh, I reached the conclusion that uh, I'm not gonna do it but but uh, i have uh, researched uh, the majority of it uh, because basically when we started doing ebtc which is a cdp product and it's a liquidity fork but basically when you start studying the design of a cdp you have to study how arbitrage works and how liquidation works and those are basically the two biggest uh, vectors for mev the other couple of things in MEV will be sniping uh, new uh, LP positions. And then the other one will be like uh, sandwiching people, which is like, it's the one thing uh, I wouldn't do even if I did MEV for, for, for life. But like, um, you basically want to research uh, all of this stuff because it, it teaches you how to attack it. 
And so like, if you look at some of my findings on, let's say on Ethos, uh, uh, on Ethos Reserve, which was another liquidity fork on Optimism by the, the guys at Bytes Mason, um, I basically sent a bunch of uh, MEV kind of related stuff there because I, I kind of built uh, that edge myself where I built simulations related to making liquidations profitable, checking price impact on pools, arbitraging the pools. And uh, with Badger, we also built, like we, we did something really cool because we all believed in the, and we still do, but basically we believe in the like self-custodial idea of like having actual vaults that you cannot rug, that they just work on chain fully uh, autonomously. And so the way you solve that at the pricing level, or as in how do you find where, where to sell a shitcoin basically, uh, was by creating a contract we called the on-chain pricer, which we went through four different iterations. And basically the on-chain pricer will query multiple uh, pools on balancer and then multiple uh, pools on Uniswap and on Uniswap v3 and on curve. And it will basically find the best swap that was available. And uh, in, in researching something like that, first of all, we were able to do it, uh, uh, to write it to be very gas efficient compared even to like uh, uh, the, the, the Uniswap v3 router or something like that, uh, especially if we're getting a quote, because if you, if you ever do a quote on Uniswap v3, they use just this quarter contract that reverts, which is basically a massive waste of gas. Whereas we actually built an internal simulation in memory, so it was cheaper. But, uh, but basically, once you, once you build something like that, you basically built an arbitraging bot because you just tell it token A to token B, token B to token A. And it, obviously, it's single, uh, single segment, so it's not as efficient as a multi-segment fragmented liquidity type deal. But you still basically learned all of those aspects. And what we did with that is we put it on a contract called the bribes processor, which is a contract that will claim bribes for these different locking protocols and it will sell them via CowSwap, but instead of selling it via CowSwap by just trusting some order or setting zero and basically trusting CowSwap, it would actually use this on-chain price, which can still be manipulated 100%. It can still be manipulated, but it costs a lot more to manipulate for, for the size that we had. And so it basically was a way to make it so that those tokens couldn't actually be sold you know, for the classic mean amount equals zero. And, and, uh, and I feel like that's something that uh, can be actually solved is the is the all of these harvesting stuff can basically be harvested safely because at that small size it costs more to sandwich you than to actually check if you're being sandwiched and basically prevent that and so that's what we did and that's why i got that interest in uh, in mev as well yeah i think in that comes back to what we spoke before that there's an endless things for you to discover in this space you know the more you dig into it there's more things you can learn and build yourself a moat or let's say an edge over others in the business and that's one of the things that make this field is really exciting you can just let your curiosity guide you and there's always things that there is always going to benefit you in some sort of way yeah and i feel like it's just um, like there's a very interesting dynamic in uh, in all of crypto and is that once you have a successful project you don't want to break it like the incentives for you to like build something small and get wrecked and cause you know a disaster is 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 like the downside is so big that you really like success becomes a trap in my opinion for most projects and so i feel like if you stay independent and you, you there's like a few lines that you don't cross where you don't actually Let's say you'd never press the button in terms of an exploit because you don't want to cross the line or perhaps you never sell investments because you don't want to cross the line and you just keep you keep doing your own thing and you keep your, yourself uh, uh, more as a researcher on the researcher side. You have so much more flexibility because you are you, there is no downside in risking. I can write my own yield farm. Mm -hmm. It's going to break whatever i can write my own yield farm it's gonna farm the new you know shitcoin that goes 100x it's gonna change my life and i'll probably be doing the same thing tomorrow anyway because uh, at this point i feel like the fun of this entire space is more in the engagement than uh, the money itself even though the space definitely comes with uh, with perks there as well so i think it's, it's just a great uh, place to be and then I, what I will say in terms of the security research that I think it ha has over most other 
aspects of crypto is that it's like uh, genuinely positive because like you are actually preventing people's lives from being ruined and so not only it's like well respected well paid but it's also doing something good for people that are otherwise would be worse worse off and so I, I feel like that's the, the other aspect that we have in security research specifically that you don't necessarily have in more of these financial stuff that is more, uh, you know, uh, either MEV or like promises of this stuff, because on that stuff, you still have to uh, uh, deal with uh, uh, all of those downsides. Whereas if you're staying independent as a security researchers, you, you don't necessarily have them. And I feel like most people recognize this at this point, And that's kind of why there has been this movement. And maybe one day as the bull market comes back, more people are going to be like, you know, all uh, excited. And so the, the degeneracy will go back, I guess. Yeah, I definitely agree that the security community is overwhelmingly positive. Even despite being such a high competitive field, everyone is very welcoming. There's always people willing to share their expertise, even the more senior researchers like yourself are always down to talk to newcomers and basically show everyone the ropes and that definitely makes it a lot more pleasurable and easier to go through the beginner stage where you might not be getting the results that you want to get or maybe understanding the content in the way that you think you should and having those experts like teach you and show you the way definitely makes it easier and just more pleasurable for everyone. Yeah, I think I think that's the case. Although what I will say there is I think once you suffered enough in life, you will just take the opportunities. So that that has been kind of my perspective that I that I've noticed also. It's like most most people that are really, really, really good, like the elite people, they kind of know when to suffer and they know when it's not necessary. So an example would be uh, going back to the, the, po the, the polygon uh, craze of yield farming. An example was the, the first project that launched a, a goose finance fork. Do you remember goose finance? The one with the thing in the, on the left uh, with the uh, golden egg uh, and the price. It's like it's a really classic shape of a website that uh, was popular. But basically the first project was called poly whale. And I think there was another called poly fox. And basically those people understood that the second Polygon announced these kind of incentives, they basically were on a clock to just launch this thing and become the biggest project there. That was basically it. And so me kind of on a more conservative side, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do the hackathon, I'm gonna build the thing slowly. And basically the, the, like, the, the two days after the incentives were launched, they were already live and they had, I don't know, maybe a hundred million in TVL, like an insane thing. They basically blew up, right? And they, I think they had like 4% deposit fee. So like they, they made $4 million in three days, basically. Like who knows what happens? Cause obviously, you know, who knows uh, whether it was worth it or, or, you know, whether they got them into more trouble, we'll never know. But at the end of the day, they basically seized the opportunity and I feel like the same thing happened with a few of the OGs in uh, Coderina and security research is like they don't need to be told that there's this insane opportunity. They got it and then they were secretly just plotting away and working on it. It's just that there's a point, I think, where once uh, you either have some success or, you know, life changes or you get burned out where it's like it's not just uh, like that's not enough. Basically, you don't just want to win. You want to win together or you want to do something more than it's just, you know, grinding away at your computer. And so I feel like people eventually have a kind of this different uh, take where they start sharing a little bit more, even though we all agree that, you know, sharing is, you know, leaking your alpha or a vulnerability. And so you wouldn't necessarily want to do that, but there's a point where it doesn't matter and we can basically grow together and grow the industry and all, we can all win anyway. So what's the point of, you know, uh, not having fun in the process? Yeah, at the end of the day, we are all human. We all want some sort of meaning and make an impact. Yeah, I would say from from my from like from my perspective, the first goal that I need to achieve is to win a contest. 
Like the joke for me is like two years security research, never won a contest, ask me anything. So I definitely need to do that. And then uh, uh, going forward though, I think, uh, uh, and, and I'm not the only person who thinks this, but I, I think the, the best next move, once you become uh, uh, skilled enough, is to basically set up your own kind of infrastructure and basically become a, a white hat rescuer. So I feel like the most, the most interesting job and the most impactful job you never get to see and you never get to share because it's all about having a setup that makes it so that the day the fire starts, you are the firefighter that is there first. That's basically what the kind of the security space becomes uh, kind of at the end, in my opinion. And then maybe there will be a day where we share so much, so much knowledge that we can actually just, uh, you know, share kind of our tools and all of that stuff. And uh, everybody uses those. And in doing that, we kind of get to the next level where there's no longer any, you know, basic bug or bug that you can code on Remix uh, and, and hack it while live. Like all of this stuff goes away, which probably will very soon. But then um, we, we've, we have yet to see what happens once, uh, you know, the, you know, every kind of, instead of having a single security researcher, we start seeing a team of security researchers all working together to you know prevent bugs or to uh, perform white hat rescues which is uh, kind of the interesting aspect or kind of the interesting question i ask myself is what would happen to code arena if like there was like the let's say the racing team and they're like four people all the top four war wardens they just do a team and they just compete there and i feel like paradoxically they would actually end up cannibalizing their own business and that's why it didn't happen because you basically would end up winning less and having to more expectation for payout and winning less. And so there is an equilibrium, but we, we have yet to see kind of the other side of the pendulum where everybody goes for the same opportunities and they kind of dilute them. And eventually that, that's what's going to happen as, as the space becomes more popular and the move of becoming a security researcher becomes more obvious. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how things play out moving forward. Um, Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I know it's a bit late over there and that was a really interesting chat. I think a lot of people are going to find a lot of value from this. So thank you for coming out and having this chat with me. Yeah, it was, uh, was my pleasure. And I would say this, like, uh, if, you, if you enjoyed the conversation, we want you to write down on the comments the next thing that you're going to do. Like, what is your edge and how are you going to grow it? And what is the one thing you're going to do to grow your edge? 